This is Focus on Your Health on the KJAZZ Radio Network. It's brought to you by Kingman Regional Medical Center in historic Kingman, Arizona. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and this week my guest is Dr. Ryan Swap. He's a pathologist and the medical director of the laboratory at KRMC. Dr. Ryan Swap, welcome back. Thanks. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm glad to have you. Uh, usually a physician's first appearance on the show is the Getting to Know You program, but we had exigent circumstances last time around. We had to talk about Ebola. Yeah, the, the threat of Ebola was <laughs> imminent. And we survived it. We did. We're okay. Yes. So this is the pathology suite, and it's a secured facility. Mm -hmm. You can't just come walking in. No. Well, so what goes on behind the locked doors? Well, pathology is uh, kind of a black box for a lot of people. Um, you know, a lot of people have biopsies. Maybe you have a skin biopsy or a breast biopsy, maybe even a prostate biopsy. Um, and after that, uh, it's kind of a mystery as to where that tissue goes and who does what with it. Um, and th I guess the answer to that question is, you know, we we're on the receiving end of that. Once we receive the tissue, uh, we, we process it and we cut it up and look at it under the microscope. Right. And um, it's kind of amazing because in this era of molecular medicine and all of these things, the way that we there have been some advances and we use we do use some technology but ultimately we're classifying disease for the most part the same way that they did um, 100 years ago hmm. you know with the microscope just using the morphologic characteristics of what you see under there do you have much contact with patients themselves you know we really don't have that much contact with patients um, occasionally you know I'll, I'll speak with them about their disease sometimes patients rarely but occasionally will ask to speak with a pathologist. And a lot of cancer diagnoses come along with things that we see under the microscope that predict the course of their disease. For example, um, maybe the number of mitoses. That's what happens when all the chromosomes replicate. They line up and then they pull apart. Okay. And you can see that under the microscope. And so it makes sense that uh, with diseases that are dividing mo more rapidly, such as cancer, and ag more aggressive forms of cancer will divide more often, obviously. Mm -hmm. So you'll see more mitoses. Normal cells also divide, and you will see occasional mitoses, but in usually you don't catch that under the microscope. Right. So when we see it, it's a concerning thing, and in diseases such as melanoma, it's actually uh, a prognostic factor. It, it is in other diseases, too. Uh, we use a surrogate for a mitotic figure, such as uh, the key 67 proliferation index. It's an immunohistochemical marker, and depending on what percentage of, of uh, positivity you get, that tells you how active that disease is in growing. Right. Hello, dear listener. This is your host speaking. I hope you'll pardon the interruption, but when Dr. Swap began talking about mitoses, I had a feeling I was in over my head. When he mentioned the key 67 proliferation index, I was certain of it. So while I figure out how to steer this conversation, please enjoy The Girl from Ipanema. Thank you. So, okay, at some point I did an interview with a physician, and off the top of my head I forget who it was, but he basically said, there are so many different branches of medicine that if you're interested in medicine, whatever your personality, there's an avenue for you. You know, and there's sort of, it's a kind of a stereotype, right? But I know where this is going. All right, you know where it's going, but I'm going to take it there anyway. <laughs> there's this kind of a stereotype about what kind of person makes a surgeon. Yeah. And what kind of person wants to work in the emergency room. Right. Right. And certainly what kind of person wants to be a pediatrician. Okay. Fair enough. So you're kind of locked up in your fortress all day. Yeah. And you're working with your machines. You have a staff here, but you don't have a whole lot of, um, what do you call it, human contact? Yeah. So the stereotype for pathology, you know, is not very sexy. Uh, <laughs> it's really the guy, you know, they think about the guy who looks really nerdy and maybe l looks at his shoes while he talks. Okay. That's kind of the stereotype of pathology. Uh -huh. We try to, you know, not live up to that. Right. Um, and the truth of the matter is that the contact that we have is mostly with physicians. Right. So, you know, when I'm looking at cases, I'll frequently give a physician a call and say, hey, I just want to give you a heads up on this case. Uh, you know, this was an abnormal case. This is maybe something you should watch. Maybe I won't call it 
dysplasia, but maybe there maybe there are features that that make me concerned or that we should maybe get a larger biopsy or something like that. Right. I was kind of giving you a hard time a moment ago, <laughs> but I get it totally because like um, I think I'm that guy too. Too much personal contact is just exhausting to me. I yeah. love doing interviews, but then I like to go home to my studio in the quiet and work with my machines. And mm-hmm. you know, I, I like people. And actually, <laughs> you know, when I decided to become a pathologist, the common response that I always got from from my peers and also from uh, attending physicians was, "But you're so good with people. Why would you? <laughs> Why do would that? you do that? <laughs> right? Why would you throw that away?" Well, and the stereotype <laughs> is actually the guy that's that's performing autopsies. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, so there are all kinds of jokes made about you know, seeing live patients versus dead patients. Uh-huh. And right. uh, yeah, they, the, you know, people really, there's just a, it's a fertile field, you know, so you can make all kinds of jokes about that. And, uh, and many were made. <laughs> <laughs> so you're here on the radio doing some damage control. Uh, I'm trying to, your... I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> somebody needs to do it. You told me a moment ago that you're using essentially the same technology that was used a hundred years ago when you classified disease today. Yeah. But you have a lab with a bunch of expensive gear in it. And so I'm wondering if we just sort of tossed you into some really remote medically underserved area, third world country, for example, and you didn't have this kind of gear with you, how much of your job could you do? How much would you have to adjust if you had very simple tools and technology around you? I think you would be surprised that you could do a lot of your job there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we have large machines and expensive equipment, and a lot of it has to do with um, efficiency and being able to do a large amount of work. But, uh, for example, um, my in-laws have a orphanage in Guatemala that they've wow they've funded for a long time, and part of that mission was to bring down some some uh, folks to provide medical care. Yeah. This was before I was a pathologist, but I remember as a med student going down there and uh, the surgeons, you know, operating on people. And really, I didn't realize it at the time, but they, they really would have benefited from a pathologist being there to tell them what some of these lesions were. Wow. So even without the expensive equipment, you know, we can stick a needle in something, get some cells off of there, smear it on a slide, and then dip it in some stains and look at it under the microscope and have a pretty good idea of what's going on. So this provides a nice segue because uh, we're talking about going out into the world and your and your training and experience have taken you far and wide. I know you're reluctant to talk about it. You were a Fulbright scholar. Yeah, right after um, I finished my undergraduate education, I applied for a Fulbright fellowship and um, and so that that took me and my newly uh, married wife to Slovenia with our uh, brand new three month old daughter. <laughs> uh huh. Take a step back for a moment. Essentially, what is a Fulbright fellow? So the Fulbright program was set up just following World War II. And the idea was to set up a kind of program that would foster goodwill between nations. The role is is kind of a, an academic ambassador in a way. So I proposed a project and the project entailed um, collecting genetic material from people in Slovenia, and then comparing that to their um, genealogic trees. Okay. And and what we were trying to do was to uh, take that genetic material and correlate it with birthplaces and birth dates wow. of ancestors. And so you're what you're trying to do is get a snapshot of a geographic location, a genetic snapshot of a geographic location at a time period, and see how that had changed over time. Uh, okay, so you're sort of charting the drift of genetic information right yeah. yeah you can think of it that way okay and um and that's so that's what i pitched and um and i had a an institution that was responsible for uh, hosting me and was very generous to me i i just found everyone that i met in slovenia to be you know occasionally appropriately skeptical but mm-hmm. you know very open and generous and um you know i i just had a wonderful experience there. you were how old when you went there so I had just finished, I suppose I was... Like 22? Something? 24. 24? 24 when I went. And so when you're 24 and you're a Fulbright fellow and you're, you've got this grant to go around the world and study genetic, I mean, does, is it kind of surreal? Did you feel this was coming or... It's totally surreal to yeah. me. I mean, 
you can kind of imagine a picture. So this was back in the day when the airlines allowed you to take, you know, multiple knives um, and guns. Well, all kinds of stuff, you know, and, and more luggage pieces. So you can imagine me and my wife and my three month old daughter. And for us to afford to be able to, to actually make it there, we I think our flight was like had like five layovers or something ridiculous. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh we have this memory of us laying uh, on the lawn in, in some famous square in London, you know, cause we're just totally jet lagged and we're just like <laughs> asleep on the lawn with our luggage everywhere and uh-huh. our baby that's sitting there. That's a photo. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we took like eight suitcases and our baby and just went over there yeah. and, you know, made a go of it for nine months. And it was surreal, uh, to be, you know, talking to and interviewing. And, you know, at one point the media kind of caught a hold of this and, right. And I, I knew Slovenian because I'd served an LDS mission there for two years. Right. And, uh, you know, Slovenia is a, a very small country of two million people uh, in the, it's kind of nestled between Italy, Austria, and Croatia, right, right. there at the tip of the, the north tip of the Adriatic Sea. The only thing that kept the Slovenes together for all of those years before they finally got independence in 1991 was their language. So the ultimate compliment, and I think this is true in other cultures as well, but but definitely for the Slovenes because of of uh, their language. The language that was the only thing that really identified them as a people. Uh-huh. And so to go over there and learn their their language, you know, all of their all of their cultural heroes are poets, authors, and playwrights. Yeah. Um, and so I became a bit of a novelty. And then <laughs> and then these uh, news organizations. You know, I was on the radio a few times, and then I kind of made the rounds in the newspapers. And I was on TV one time. And uh, I knew I had had my 15 minutes of fame when I was hiking one time on the top of this hill, you know, in this, this mountain in Slovenia. And this guy comes up to me and he's like, you're that guy. You're that American guy. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, that, that was kind of fun. Dobro no za trenutek bomo počakali in se bomo vrnili čez par minut. I couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, my brain was really doing somersaults to try to find that, uh, find those words. <laughs> she looked me over and I guess she thought I was all right. All right in the sort of a limited way for an off night. She said, don't I know you from the cinematographer's part? Welcome back to Focus on Your Health on the KJAZ Radio Network. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and this week I'm speaking with Dr. Ryan Swap. He's a pathologist and the medical director of the laboratory at KRMC. When a biopsy comes to you here in the lab, mm-hmm. what is going on in that patient's life at that point? If it's a skin biopsy, maybe they've seen a dermatologist or a, um, a general practitioner and they've got a suspicious lesion, or maybe the patient's noticed something that they're concerned about. They want to know what it is. Yeah. And the only real way to know is to is to take a biopsy and to look at it under the microscope. Right. Other things come up on annual screenings, like um, like a mammogram. So, you know, if a woman goes in and and has a concerning lesion on her breast, um, depending on what kind of a lesion it is, uh, will dictate what kind of a biopsy is made. And then we receive that biopsy, and it's usually a a couple of cores of tissue. And you can usually get a pretty good idea of what's going on in that woman's breast and and correlate the radiologic findings with what we're seeing under the microscope. Right. You know, there's an incredible amount of time and effort to get the whole story from a patient as to what's going on with them. And by the time a biopsy gets to me, it's really kind of the essence of the case, right. you know, right there. Yeah. And so you kind of get the meat of the case, yeah. you know, again and again and again. And that's kind of what your day is, is yeah. uh, you're in kind of, um, you're, you're, you're looking at the essence of the case all the time. When you kind of take a step back and reflect in the big picture of what you do and what you've learned about, the human body. I mean, you, you look at tissues, you look at the insides of us, the parts we don't know about. And, and, you know, so many people get cancer and so many people are afraid of it. Right. And, um, I mean, it's, it's touched every single one of us. Absolutely. And you're in here 
examining these tissues every day and seeing this. And I, how am I trying to say it? Do you have these moments where you kind of step back and say, wow, I mean, you know, you have this kind of occult knowledge that we, right? Do you know what I'm getting at? I I'm, do. I mean, I'm I, looking I, for some big picture well, philosophical statement on, <laughs> on human beings. I'm looking for the meaning of life, Dr. Swap. Can you help me? You, you've come to the right place. <laughs> um, what I try to think about, it, you know, I'm in here, like you said, I'm kind of cut off from patients. And so I'm just looking at case after case and I'm looking at slides and paper and trying to make sense of that. And uh, occasionally, um, well, I try to do this on a daily basis. You know, I'll, I'll kind of look and look at the age of the patient and the sex of the patient and, and you know, why they're doing the biopsy. And, you know, I'm, I'm coming up on 36 now. And some of these patients are my age, you know, and are receiving a diagnosis of cancer. And I try to think about what's happening in their life. In fact, uh, this morning I was looking at a case of an acquaintance of mine and, um, you know, I just thought it would, if I were in their shoes, I would really want to know what, you know, what the diagnosis was mm -hmm. here. And so I was able to pick up the phone in that case and just, you know, put their mind at ease. Um, but I try to think about that. And, um, and so, you know, we try to turn around the cases as quickly as we can, but I, I try to think of it, you know, I think it, it kind of wards off the, I think physicians are susceptible to a kind of Philistinism, uh -huh. you know, it's easy to become callous and, uh -huh. um, a kind of a process mentality, yeah, I right? Mean, I, th this is really talked about a lot, I'm, as I'm sure you know, and, but it's, I mean, it is true and it's, it's real and it's, it's easy to just kind of see, see these slides as another case when right. they represent a, a, a human being. And, um, so I, I try to do that and, you know, I try to talk about that, uh, with my colleagues, with my wife and, you know, I think it, it, um, helps remind me that the work that we do is important. And even though we're not out actually taking care of patients and comforting them, you know, we play an important role in their care. That's what I try to do. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes you have to pass on word that, uh, some, some really grave diagnoses, right? Yeah, you know, most of the time the clinicians pass that news along. Right. But occasionally something will happen where a patient will contact me and uh, will say they want to go over their results. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it happens sometimes that they'll say, well, you know, at least it, at least it's not this bad. And sometimes it is that bad. And right. so it's, you know, having that conversation with them. And How do you do that? Does that weigh heavily on you? I think the best way to do it is to be straightforward with empathy. Yeah. You know, um, I think people appreciate being told the truth and, um, you know, they, they have a, a limited amount of, you know, weeks to months left. And, sure. you know, at that point, if it were me, I'd want to know so that I could plan appropriately and right. use that time appropriately. Right. And sometimes, you know, people, um, you know, we're shooting for a cure when that's maybe not really attainable for them. Right. And that actually, that aspect of it does weigh on me because, you know, I look at cancer all the day. I'm reminded of my mortality every single day. That's incredible. So you think about death a lot because you look at it all day, yeah. you know, and yeah. it's the same for other physicians. But, you know, I just happen to be looking at cancer a lot. Right. But I think I think part of it is, even when there's some really bad news ahead for the patient, it's um, it's a matter of treating that situation and that patient with dignity and saying, you know, I, I can't. I'm going to do what I can do. We're going to do what we can do, but we also need to acknowledge what's going on. And right, I mean, that's dignity to to be honest with someone rather than. <laughs> I think so. I, I mean, there's been a shift in medicine away from a kind of paternalism uh -huh. where kind of doctor knows best and you get a pat on the head. Right. You, yeah, yeah. you know, patients have been much more engaged in their own health and, you know, in the reality of, um, of their lives, uh, at least in some instances. And it certainly seems to be that way with a lot of, um, cancer treatment. Uh, and I, I think that it is respect to, to be honest with someone. I was recently approached by a colleague who had a loved one, you had a really pretty grave diagnosis and I just tried to be forthright with them because if I were in their shoes, I would want, 
I would want to take a trip. You know, I'd want to spend right. some time and I'd want to, I'd want to get my stuff together so that, yeah. you know, I could leave this life the way that I wanted to. We talked a little bit about the lab. You want to take me in and show me around a little bit? Absolutely, yeah. Let's go back to the workshop. So we're going to look at a lumpectomy breast specimen. If a woman has an abnormality radiographically, they take a needle core biopsy and we diagnose, say, cancer. The woman still has the option to keep her breast intact and to remove the portion of the breast that's involved with the cancer. That's what a lumpectomy is, essentially just taking a lump out. The breast is sent to us in formalin. So we're opening the container. You can see this is a kind of lump of tissue about six by eight centimeters by three centimeters. There's a needle sticking out of it, which is placed by radiologists before the surgeon takes it out so they know they're getting the right tissue. And then once the surgeon takes it out, they ink it. You can see that we've got red ink, orange ink, blue ink, yellow ink, and black ink, um, which kind of tell us whether which surfaces um, we're looking at. Green is anterior, blue is inferior, and so on. And so uh, I'm just going to take a knife here and um, we're going to cut through the specimen. You can see right here there's kind of a, a white firm area in the center there. And that's probably the lesion that we're that we're looking at. Now you can't just tell whether or not a margin is involved by cancer. We have to take a part of that tissue, put it in these cassettes here. We process them, take all the water out. You suck all the water out of the tissue and as you know, you know, our bodies are made up mostly of water. And then we embed it with wax. Um, and then the next day uh, we put it in even more wax and then slice it very thinly, stain it, and look at it. And that, that's how we can tell uh, if there's cancer. Tomorrow we'll look at this block. We'll see the red there and we'll know that the red is the superior margin. And if there's cancer close to that margin, we'll know that it's close to the superior aspect of the cavity that, that was left by the surgeon. You know, we're trying to correlate what we see here just with our naked eye to what we see under the microscope and uh, there are a number of lesions that you know that we see under the microscope that have a correlate here this is a, a really firm mass I mean this is almost certainly cancer here um, there's very very few things that look like this My thanks to Dr. Ryan Swap, pathologist and medical director of the laboratory at Kingman Regional Medical Center. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and thank you for listening. Please join me again next Saturday at 11.30 a.m. for another edition of Focus on Your Health, right here on the KJAZZ Radio Network.